always a pleasure just to be able to come in and get in the word with you all and, and just make sure that, that we have this chance to discuss the kingdom every week. I, I know we've been digging our wheels in the same place for, for quite a while now, but, but one thing I've learned in studying the word uh, is you, you cannot rush studying the scriptures. And so for us to, to stay here and take this time uh, to really make sure we get uh, an understanding of God's word is very, very uh, important to all of us. Uh, you should have your handouts from the last time. We did not quite finish them. In fact, I think uh, we only covered maybe the first two points of it. So we're going to, uh, we're going to pick up where we left off at. Uh, we've been in Matthew chapter 10, and, and we've talked about the first point already, uh, the fact that Jesus called his disciples unto himself. In fact, in the very first verse is, is all we got to last week. Uh, Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 said, And he called to him his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal every disease and every affliction. So we picked up from that first verse uh, that Jesus did two things. One, he called his disciples unto himself. Uh, we have been called to Jesus, not to anything else. So that has to, it has to be that abandonment uh, to Christ. And the second thing we saw is that Jesus gave his disciples authority. And we have that authority as well. Uh, we define authority. We said authority is basically delegated power, which means authority is power that has been assigned to you from someone who is recognized to be able to give that authority. We said power then, properly defined, is the ability to achieve purpose. So power is not based on wealth. It's not based on status. It's not based on how much income you have. Power is based on how well you can fulfill a particular purpose. Uh, we said that uh, the disciples were given authority to fulfill a specific purpose at a specific time. They were salt and light to the generation that they served, and God gave them the authority to do that. Uh, we also have been given authority specific to our functions. Everybody in this room has the same exact purpose. We're all part of the same body. We're all trying to accomplish a goal. The Bible says in the book of Romans that where we differ is in how we function, our gifts, our talents, our abilities. And God has given each of us authority over our spheres of influence, the areas of life that God has given us particular dominion over. Those are going to be areas, areas where you're going to have authority. They're going to be areas in your life uh, where you're able to function like nobody else can. So once we see that Jesus gave his disciples uh, called to his disciples unto himself and gave his disciples authority, we then see Jesus giving his disciples a, commanded, a commandment. In fact, Jesus commanded the disciples to do what he had authorized them to do. Jesus gave his disciples a commandment to do what he had authorized them to do. They couldn't just go out and do what they want to, wanted to with the power that they had, with the authority that they had. They, they were only given authority over the things that he had authorized them to have authority over. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 5, the Bible says this. These 12 Jesus sent out, instructing them, go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and proclaim as you go, saying, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse lepers, cast out demons, you receive without paying, give without paying. So the first thing that, that Jesus tells his disciples to do, in his first commandment to them, after giving them authority, he said, teach the kingdom. Teach the kingdom. That's the first thing he told them to do. Now, we've been in this scripture long enough to know that the number one thing Jesus taught about was the kingdom of God. No matter which one of the Gospels you read, no matter what part of the Bible you go to, you see the kingdom of God prevalent throughout scriptures. And in the Gospel of Matthew and the teachings of Jesus, we see that Jesus predominantly went around teaching others about the, the, about the kingdom of God. And when he authorized his disciples and he got ready to send them out, he gave them a specific commandment. And his first commandment to them was to teach the kingdom. This is the commandment he gave to his disciples, and this is the commandment he gives to us. Now, how many of you in here are qualified to teach calculus? <laughs> Two people. <laughs> 
two people, and that's Ms. Goosen and Ms. Villafane. They're qualified because they have the knowledge, they have the understanding, and they have certification to be able to do it. But most of us in this room didn't raise our hand because we're not qualified nor authorized to teach calculus. We don't have the knowledge that we need. And in order for you to be able to teach the kingdom, guess what you gotta have? You gotta have knowledge of God's kingdom. See, you can go to any church, you can go to any place, and they can teach you a lot of stuff. But if they're not teaching you the kingdom, then right from the beginning, you're not equipped to do the very first thing that Jesus commanded all of his disciples to do, which is to teach others concerning his kingdom. Now, this does not mean you have to teach from the pulpit. It doesn't mean you have to be up on Sunday mornings in a church to teach the kingdom of God. But God needs kingdom-minded educators. God needs kingdom-minded lawyers. God needs kingdom-minded doctors. God needs kingdom-minded engineers. God needs kingdom-minded mathematicians. God needs kingdom-minded nurses. God needs kingdom-minded people in every system of society. So you discover the hidden principles of a particular domain or spirit influence, and you teach concerning those principles. That's how you teach the kingdom of God. When Jesus said to his disciples, go into all the world, teach the world what I have taught you. Here's what Jesus was saying. There are two words the Bible uses for the word world. One is celestial, one is terrestrial. One of them has to do with physical property, physical land, going about a physical space. That wasn't the one that Jesus used. So he wasn't saying go into all the physical earth and teach concerning my kingdom, but he used a word that refers to a system of order. So when he said go into all the world, he was, say, he was saying go into the systems of the world. He's saying go into education, go into the entertainment industry, go into the medical field, go into all of these places and teach what I have taught you. So the first thing he told his disciples was teach the kingdom. The second thing he was basically telling his disciples to do was to demonstrate the kingdom. See, teaching the kingdom is not enough. We also have to demonstrate the kingdom with the way that we live. We show forth God's glory in the lives that we present, in the lifestyles that we have. Now, if you look at what Jesus told his disciples to do specifically, he said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, do all those things. Now, now most of us don't have a gift of healing. Most of us don't have a gift where we can go and just lay hands on somebody and then all of a sudden they're healed from every single disease. Jesus wasn't saying specifically do those things for us. What he was saying was show forth my kingdom. Show that my kingdom is evident in you. When, when Jesus performed miracles, when his disciples performed miracles, what they were really interested in doing was demonstrating the presence of the kingdom of God. The way a kingdom works is that a king embodies all the authority of a kingdom. He is the government. Now, a representative government like we have in the United States is very different because in order for you to embody your whole entire government, you got to have a, a, a Senate and a House of Representatives. You got to have an executive branch, a legislative branch, and all those people combined make up a government. In a kingdom, it's not so. In a kingdom, the king is the government. So all authority is really and truly in that one person, that one individual. He has all power in a kingdom. That's how it works. So wherever a king is, his kingdom is with him. The authority of his kingdom is with him. The power of his kingdom is with him. So when Jesus performed miracles, the only thing he was really doing was demonstrating the fact that the kingdom of God was present. Because in the kingdom of God, there is no sickness. In the kingdom of God, there is no disease. In the kingdom of God, there is no death. So this is how Jesus was able to heal people, because he was using the authority of his kingdom. This does not align with my kingdom. And I am here present with this kingdom, and the power of this kingdom is with me. Therefore, what is in this person has to be healed. Jesus was able to raise people from the dead. Why? Because there is no death in his kingdom. Anything that comes into, into contact with the presence of the kingdom of God has to come alive. Now, I, I, I can't heal you, but I can encourage you. You could be at a point in your life where you're low, you're, you're destitute, you're depressed, and I could liven you up. I can encourage you. I can lift your spirit. You could be at a point in your life where things may not be right in your heart, 
I can encourage you. I can strengthen you. I can help you in your weakness, help you cleanse your heart. There, there are things I can do beyond just the physical representation of the kingdom of God. That makes sense. So he told them to demonstrate the kingdom of God. It doesn't do any good to just to teach it. We have to demonstrate it as well. Here's the third thing he told them. He said, live generously. Live generously. In order to be able to live generously, we have to also go back to how kingdoms work. In the kingdom of God, there is neither rich or poor. Because the way a kingdom is designed, in a kingdom, you don't own anything. Everything belongs to the king. So you can't have rich and you can't have poor because rich or poor is based on how much you possess. How much material stuff you have accumulated. In the kingdom of God, you don't have anything. Nothing belongs to you. Everything belongs to the king. Therefore, you can't have rich or poor. And also, since it belongs to the king, you have to use it however the king says to use it. And when you don't use it according to how the king says to use it, then you're using it uh, in, in opposition to his will. You're not using it according to the will of the king. A will is actually a legal term. It's not just a word that we throw around in prayer. A, a will is actually kingdom language, which refers to the expressed desires of a king. A will is the expressed desires of a king. Now, when you take the expressed desires of a king, which is his will, and you write it down, it then becomes a testament. So the written will of a king is a testament. This is why we refer to the Bible as a New Testament and the Old Testament. The written will of a king is a testament. When you speak the written will of a king, you give a testimony, which is basically you confirm that this testament is correct. That's how kingdoms function. That's how kingdoms work. Everything in a kingdom belongs to a king. And you have to get that in your mind. Everything you possess, if you're a citizen of the kingdom of God, then you recognize that whatever you have, it doesn't belong to you. It belongs to the king. And if the king moves on my heart to use this for his will and for his purpose, the more obedient I am to fulfilling that, the more God will use me. So when God blesses me, with a whole lot of money, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with being wealthy at all. When God blesses me with all of that, how I use it according to his will will determine whether or not I'm truly demonstrating the kingdom of God in my life. Most people I know who are truly wealthy are also big givers. They live generously. They're always looking for ways to help other people. So here's the substance of all of that. In order to live generously, always be willing to give whatever is in your hand to give. It's not always about money. It's not always about material things. But whatever God has given you, you use it for his glory. Whether it's your time, whether it's your talents, whether it's your abilities. This is why at ACS we're always pushing you to volunteer. Because we want you to get in the mindset and the habit of giving your time and your resources and your talents and your abilities to others. Because it's not just about you and you blessing yourself. Jesus had the power to take himself off the cross, but he didn't do it. Because he recognized that he was on that cross not for himself, but for us. And had he come off the cross, there would be no us. That makes sense. So living generously is about using whatever you have to give to others. And that can be your time, your talent, your ability, your resources, whatever it is that he's given you. Here's an example. In Acts chapter 3, the apostle Peter was near the gate called Beautiful. And that was a beggar. And this was common in those times. People would sit by busy gates and they would beg for money. Usually if you had a disability and you couldn't work, you would just sit around on a busy street corner and you would beg. So there was a particular beggar who was standing at a, uh, sitting at a gate. He was lame, wasn't able to walk, and he was begging people for money. And the apostle Peter came up to this man, and this is what he told him. He said, silver and gold I do not have. In other words, Peter was saying, I don't have money. <laughs> now this was an apostle. He was following Jesus. You would think he'd be rich, but that wasn't always the case. He said, I don't have money. But what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. I don't have money, but I have a gift. I have a power. I have authority. I have talents. I have abilities. I can help you. So I may not be able to give you what you're asking me for, 
but I can still bless your life. So it's not always about the material things. Sometimes it's about using whatever it is that God has given you. Some of you, when you sit in a math class, you might not feel like the smartest person on earth. Because it seems like several people in the class may be getting this concept, but you just can't seem to figure it out. You just can't seem to grasp it. You, can't, you just can't seem to get a hold of it. That might be you in a math class. But if I put you in a domain that you're used, you, you're used to, some of you are gifted musicians. Some of you are talented artists. Some of you are designed to do things that I'll never be able to do. And if I try to do what you're gifted at doing, I would look dumb. I would look like I'm foolish. You gotta learn to recognize your spirit influence and use what God has given you to do. So here's something else. So not only did he call them unto himself and give them authority and then gave them specific commandments, he also began to prepare them. He said, if you're gonna be my disciple, if you're gonna follow me, you have to recognize you're gonna be persecuted. So Jesus instructed them to expect and prepare for persecution. He said, prepare yourself for this. Because it's, it's not a matter of if you're going to be persecuted, but when are you going to be persecuted. Not a matter of if, but when. He said, this is going to happen, so you need to prepare yourself for it. So he told him, you're going to be persecuted for my sake. We have to understand that as disciples of Christ, we are going to face persecution. Now, there are people who face physical death. Their, their lives are taken or their lives are threatened because of what they believe in Christ. But just because we don't face the physical aspect of persecution doesn't mean we can't be persecuted. If you've ever tried to do something right, or if you've ever tried to get your life in order, or if you ever try to do something positive or do what you're supposed to do, if you find yourself in the middle of a bunch of people who seem to discourage you because you're trying to do what's right, that's persecution. Y'all can refer to it as bullying sometimes, but there's a, there's a difference. When I am standing up for what's right and I'm standing up for the truth and I'm being wrongly accused or convicted or mistreated because of what I believe and it's causing no harm to anybody else, I'm being persecuted. Some of you face some of that stuff right now because you want to live a life for God. You want to be completely abandoned to him. But every time you take one step forward, you have friends around you or classmates around you who discourage you and make you take a step back. So Jesus is saying, prepare for this. Get ready for it because that's a part of the process. That's a part of what prepares you to truly be a true believer and a mature believer in me. It prepares you for what's to come. The kingdom of God is not given by favor, it's given by fitness. It's given by how prepared you are to live in and receive his kingdom. So it's not a matter of favor, but a matter of fitness. And overcoming the persecution is what gets you fit for the kingdom of God. Overcoming peer pressure is what gets you fit to lead your peers. Because I can't lead my peers if I'm doing the same thing my peers are doing, that's wrong. I can't be their leader if they can't imitate what I'm doing and be in alignment with Christ. So overcoming peer pressure is the key to leading your peers. But so often we allow those things that disagree with us and the position that we're in to make us shrink back and to make us fall short. But he told them to prepare for persecution. Now, now, one thing I want to make clear to you, this is one of the points I make. This refers to persecution for the sake of Christ, not persecution due to ineffective ministry. Now, what in the world do I mean by that? Sometimes we face hardship in trying to encourage others to live for Christ, not because we're so much wrong or people don't like us, but it's the way we do things. It's our approach to it. Sometimes we can be, I want to say this carefully, sometimes people can act. I'm not going to say be, I'm going to say act. Sometimes people can act too holy. Sometimes, sometimes people can act too right to the point where they think they're better than you. Y'all get me on that one? That's a discouraging factor in ministry. 
Because what we have to learn how to do is to help people without hurting them. The goal is not to try to get people to be like us. The goal is to try to get people to be like Christ. And I can't get people to be like Christ if I'm trying to get people to be like me because I think I'm better than them. So my approach in ministry has to be effective as well. The way I come at them, the way I talk to them, the way I present God will make a difference. Another point I make here, and I'm, and I'm done for today. Some people should keep waiting on ministry. Being rejected due to overzealousness is not the same as being rejected over the truth. So we have to be effective in how we approach people in the kingdom of God. Remember, we mentioned this before. You have to adapt the message without adopting the message of the world around you. You adapt, but not adopt, and it helps us to remain effective in the kingdom of God. So here's just an overview of where we begin. Jesus called his disciples unto himself. You are to be abandoned to Jesus. Jesus gave his disciples authority. You have been equipped to do whatever it is God has put in your life to do. You are able to do it, whatever it is. There, there, is neither, there is nothing neither God or man can put in front of you that you're not able to accomplish. That's how powerful of a person you truly are. And you have to learn to believe that. If God puts it in front of you, then he's already given you the authority to do it. If man puts it in front of you, then he's not more powerful than God that has already equipped you so you're able to do it. So he gave them authority. And then he gave them a commandment. Teach the kingdom. Demonstrate the kingdom. Live generously. And the final thing he told them was to be prepared for persecution. Don't think that everybody's going to agree with you. Don't think that everybody's going to just come along with you just because you're trying to do what's right. What's right, you do what you're supposed to do, regardless of what others do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you right now for this time that we've had together. Uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. And Father, we certainly pray that it would be deep inside of our hearts, that you would help us to stay focused on you in spite of what we face, in spite of what we deal with. May you continue to equip us, challenge us, strengthen us, and change us. We thank you, Father. May your name be praised and glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you all so much. <music>